mindful that their voices are heard here uh, at 100 uh, North Holiday Street. So, uh, you know, clearly that it cannot be done with just uh, one person. And we have Chairman Conway uh, on, and he's going to uh, talk about his experiences later on. Uh, but that can't just be done with one person. That's really done by a team. Uh, and I am floored and excited about the team that we have in place. Uh, look, Baltimore, we understand and know the systemic issues that have plagued our cities for far too long. Um, many have been around for as long as I've been alive. Uh, but we also know that many of the ills and the issues are byproducts of bad policy from the past. Uh, and I think that we're building a council that's taking on the autonomy, the responsibility, the ownership of trying to develop solutions, legislative policy solutions to go after some of those core issues that have been affecting us for far too long. And I think in the first 100 days, we've seen many of those things and we're gonna get into it later, um, but I'd just like to thank you and welcome you to our first, our inaugural uh, town hall. We're gonna have many of these town halls where we're gonna bring in other council members. Again, we have the amazing chairman, Mark Conway, uh, on uh, today, uh, but we're going to bring in other council members and other folks. Uh, but thank you for joining in to our first inaugural okay. town hall. Uh, Derek, if you could go into the uh, first slide. So as discussed, Just what's been really, really important to us is professionalizing the council in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that's really kind of going after and, and adhering and, and, and being responsible to what the charter uh, has uh, commanded the city council to do. Uh, in the past, the council has really been there to fill potholes, but we wanna be a council uh, that not only fills potholes, but also fills potholes in mental health, fills potholes in the uh, issues around education, uh, in the issues around the digital divide and digital equity. Uh, when we talk about housing insecurity, food insecurity, all of the things that plague out, it's really this council role to develop legislation and solutions, you know, based off of empirical data, based off of white papers, based off of best practices out there. And that's why it's so important uh, for us to build out a very professionalized staff uh, to ensure that we have subject matter expertise uh, to go after and really develop the policy that's going to help move Baltimore in the next direction. Next slide. So far, some of the steps that we've taken, you know, clearly we can't go into everything, but I wanted to highlight some of the things, particularly as it relates uh, to that mission statement is we restructured the office. Um, uh, you know, as it relates again, the subject matter expertise of uh, ensuring that we're able to dig into uh, the contracts and bids as it relates to board of estimates. Um, you know, that's really, really important part of building our city because, you know, I believe at the forefront of the contracts of the city of Baltimore, should be city businesses, city businesses that employ city residents. Uh, unfortunately, that has not always been the case. Um, but if you're able to tune into the Board of Estimates meeting, uh, literally we've taken a five to 10 meeting uh, to sometimes up to two hours uh, because we're really digging into the contracts and we're really pushing on uh, the agencies to ensure that we're opening up businesses, business and our contracts for businesses right here in the city of Baltimore that employ city residents. Uh, we again, we've professionalized the staff. I think we have uh, four uh, JDs on the staff, uh, lawyers on the staff, folks that are competent, ready, and right uh, to go after and tackle some of the challenges uh, and build out uh, and the transformative platform that we've talked about so much. I'm not only excited about their skill set that they brought to the table uh, that we've seen from the team, um, but over 90% of the staff, I would say over 95%, I got to do the actual math. Um, our Baltimore City residents in every single sector of the city. Uh, we have folks that want to work uh, for you on the city council staff uh, side, and we're really, really excited about that. Um, we restructured the city council uh, committees. So um, when taking office, we had 13 committees. Now we're down to six committees. We wanted to uh, large in, we want to create a larger uh, base of, of, of a dialogue and debate on our committees. Uh, we didn't want to have committees that were made up of three members. You know, literally two members can decide if a if a particular issue goes onto the floor on second reader. We wanted to eliminate that. Uh, so we've increased the size of our committees. And uh, we've also eliminated single district, single issue committees. Uh, no longer uh, do we have, say, an education committee where we know most of the policy is in Annapolis, not necessarily here in City Hall. Uh, but we've created an education, workforce, and youth uh, um, uh, um, a committee. 
We've also done that for transportation. We don't need a separate transportation committee. We've created a committee that's inclusive of economic development, community development, and included transportation in there because we know they go hand in hand. And then lastly, we've standardized uh, committee meetings um, as it relates to day and time. You're going to know exactly if this particular committee is going to meet um, because they have a, a, a universal day and time. Every single day and time that that committee is meeting is going to be um, on, on a regular basis. Um, there might be some um, exceptions if there's uh, critical things that we need to talk about. Uh, but from a transparent perspective, you'll know exactly when committees are meeting uh, so the general public can participate. We've also incorporated big rules. Uh, one of the big things that I'm really excited about is something that I brought back from Annapolis. No longer will we have like back of the napkin amendment uh, uh, to our committees. And, you know, you as, a, as the uh, citizens, as the residents, as our constituents, you'll be able to follow and track uh, the amendments that are placed on a bill. We know that sometimes substantive amendments can drastically change the way a bill is read in. Uh, and it's really important that we see uh, kind of the A to Z steps of how that bill has been proposed uh, to being passed uh, to ensure, again, that we are providing ultimate level of transparency to constituents. Uh, this is how most legislative bodies function. Uh, and this is how Baltimore City legislative body now functions uh, because of some of these changes. One other thing that we constantly are talking about and will continue to push is, again, the professionalizing of our city council staff, ensuring that we have fiscal analysts ensuring that we have legislative analysts. This is a best practice, not uh, something that was just dreamed about as it relates to taking over this position, um, but something that we see all across the country from federal government to state government uh, to similar cities like Baltimore City. Uh, so your council has been hard at work, will continue to be hard at work, uh, and I'm excited about some of the steps that we've taken uh, to provide a very functioning and professional council for you. Next slide. This is just a breakdown of the six committees that we spoke about earlier. As you can see at the bottom uh, of the list of members is the actual uh, day and time in which uh, they meet on a regular basis. Again, there could be some exceptions if there's something urgent that comes up, but at a minimum, you know uh, when a committee should be meeting if they're taking on an important issue. We thought that that was really, really important. Again, we also show the expanded list of council members per committee. No longer are we three members per committee and some of the committees. Uh, we have a very um, diverse group of members in each set. Um, I think the larger a group, the more uh, debate and discourse, uh, the better outcome and resolution is for our residents. And that's why we set the structure up. Next slide, please. So when we talk about getting involved, we want to open it up again, very accessible and transparent. Um, you know, we're in COVID-19, so we've all learned that the, the virtual environment is really important, uh, but I think it's really taught us lessons for not only when we come into normalcy, but forever, you know, how we can open it up. So, you know, we'll always stream our meetings uh, as it relates to um, council meetings um, uh, live on our Facebook page. Um, but what I'm really excited about is something that I also brought from Annapolis is the ability for folks to sign up to testify online. Um, you can provide your testimony if you cannot uh, do it orally in person or, or virtually, um, but you can also identify that you want to participate in this particular hearing. I think that that is really important. I'm excited about that portion of it. So we'll continue to live stream. Uh, please tune into our Facebook page is that B-A-L-T Council, Bolt Council uh, is our uh, platforms across all social media. Is our, is our username across all social media, but that's where we'll be streaming at where you can tune in and watch our meetings. Of course, we're on TV 25 uh, and um, I'm excited again about the testimony piece. Next slide. So jumping into legislation um, again, that's the core of where we are. Uh, I'm, I'm telling it, uh, I'm hearing that I need to kind of push it along so we can get to uh, Chairman Conway. Uh, but legislation, Derek, if you go to the next slide, I, you know, I told you at the end of the day, legislation is really the prescription to the cure of our ills or our problems, particularly when they slam and, and hit us uh, right head on. And we know that that's exactly what COVID-19 has done uh, for us individually, as well as us collectively, um, especially uh, on our economy and our small businesses. And what we saw during COVID was a dependency on delivery applications uh, to provide us food and to provide us other services. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, as the downturn of the economy has directly impacted our uh, small businesses, uh, the dependency on these delivery apps 
exacerbated that uh, because the delivery apps were charging in upwards of 31, 32% of the fees associated with what folks were ordering. So say for instance, you ordered something for $20 from your local restaurant. Uh, that $20 meal uh, would now only take, would now would give the delivery company four, uh, $6 and that restaurant $14. Uh, and we knew that that was a problem. So we worked uh, with our restaurants. Uh, we worked with other advocates uh, and Chairman Costello was the champion of this piece of legislation to cap delivery fees at 15%. That put money directly back into the pockets of small businesses uh, during the peak of, of economic downturn as it relates to COVID-19. That's just one thing that we did. That was the first bill uh, that came out of this council. I'm excited about that particular bill. Uh, and the business owners, uh, the small business owners, particularly in our communities, were elated uh, to have that type of relief. Next slide. Other things that you're going to hear us talk about, one thing that I'm really excited about is a bill that was just introduced two weeks ago. It's the Dante Barksdale uh, Career Technology Apprenticeship Fund. Uh, Tater Boxdale was a member of our community, of our city, of our family. Uh, he was a, a violence interrupter with Safe Streets program. Uh, nationally known for the type of job that he did as a man that literally took the experiences of his life to pour it on to others coming behind them to provide them better trajectories and better outcomes. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Boxdale was tragically killed um, and, um, you know, our city is still in mourning behind that. Um, I took a personal experience I had with Tater. Uh, he texted me prior to uh, me taking office and said, Nick, I want you to work on a bill that really provides real opportunities for our young folks in our communities uh, to uh, have access to the jobs of Baltimore City. Uh, and I took that to heart, um, particularly after he passed away. Uh, and that's what this does. This is a bill uh, that basically asks city that requires city uh, uh, contractors uh, to put into an apprenticeship fund uh, so our young folks can access to jobs uh, as it relates to whether it's capital, whether it's operational, whatever it is as it relates to providing them with real opportunities. Um, it's really developing a way of creating that conduit uh, for my young folks in the the, the amazing uh, 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 opportunities and dreams that they have in their mind to putting them in real lives, real positions to take on some of these jobs. And again, that's why I keep pushing on this thing about local jobs, local hiring with local companies. You know, at the end of the day, when we talk about this economic downturn, that is our job to ensure that we're strengthening Baltimore City businesses and Baltimore City residents are directly impacted by it. And we're going to continue to do that. Another thing that we saw was a suicide prevention legislative work group that we set up um, last year during the peak of the uh, pandemic. Uh, there was a twofold increase in suicides, completed suicides in, uh, in African American communities uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, there was an amazing study done by Johns Hopkins that really highlighted this issue. Uh, Dr. Nestet uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, was the leader behind that. Uh, and we wanted to ensure that we develop ways of filling the gaps uh, through city legislation as well as state legislation. Uh, so we called on, we called on the subject matter experts throughout the city to come together and develop different solutions for us. Uh, um, we're gonna also talk about COVID housing relief legislation. Uh, one bill just passed out, uh, um, uh, yesterday and others will come, um, but this is bills that directly talk to housing insecurity for our residents, particularly our renters. Uh, when we talk about the amount that you have to put down to try to uh, move into an apartment, when we talk about late fees and how late fees have been disproportionately um, uh, affecting uh, our renters as opposed to our homeowners. And then lastly, when we talk about uh, the loopholes that have been set up uh, around uh, this emergency relief uh, that landlords have used to put folks out uh, and put them in really harm's way. You know, right now is a very trying time for our entire nation, uh, particularly when we talk about our working class and our working poor. Uh, and this legislation speaks directly to them to help support them. Really excited about the package uh, and ensuring that we're doing all that we can do from a renter's perspective uh, to ensure that folks have the sanctity of their own home during this very, very challenging period. And then last but not least, you know, our city workers were impact, impacted significantly uh, by the um, transitioning of a new um, um, 
a workday system um, that provides out outcome that provides uh, the the, the back end human resources uh, for uh, for them. Uh, so we had a hearing. Um, we wanted to really vet through all of the issues. We opened up a link for folks to provide their specific concerns, and we've been working with human resources as well as finance to ensure that we clear them out. And we're probably about 90, 95 percent clear. Um, but we're still working. Um, but again, it's just showing you how the council has hit the ground running within 100 days to ensure that we go after and we affect um, uh, real uh, uh, change. Uh, and these are just a couple of things. Um, when we talk about uh, water bill freezing that we've called on, when we talk about ensuring that uh, we freeze uh, the tax sale liens, uh, when we talk about some of the other procurement bills that we've done, um, this council has really stepped up to try to develop substantive legislation as well as oversight of agencies uh, to provide the best possible outcome for our residents and our constituents. Next slide. So again, we constantly talk about be more, expect more, and that's exactly what I want you to do from your council. No longer are we here to just be uh, uh, filling potholes, boarding up houses, and doing the constituent concern thing, but we're really here uh, to be your to be your voice as it relates to your eyes and your ears of the issues in your community to develop legislation that goes after the systemic issues that have plagued our city for far too long. And we're going to continue to do that, um, but we also think it's important for us to be as transparent and accessible as possible. So that's why you're here for this first inaugural town hall. Uh, but we also set up an amazing magazine uh, that's going to go through and it's going to highlight council members. It's going to highlight legislation. It's going to highlight small businesses and community organizations and just the functions of what City Hall has done. Um, then la we also have a podcast, right? So we're going to bring folks in and we're going to actually talk about and peel the onion back and talk about the inner workings of city government and the things that um, we uh, 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 kind of take for granted because we're in in the mix on a regular basis, but that you might not necessarily know. So we decided to call that notes from the city council chamber. So to give you a, a backdoor, a green room, kind of look into what's going on here uh, in the city, city council. And then we have tons and tons of other things, a newsletter, uh, and again, the accessibility from Facebook Live. So I believe that wraps up the uh, slide deck. Um, I'm excited to uh, jump right into our amazing chair of uh, public safety and government operations committee that's chairman uh, mark conway uh, mark uh you're on mute i still see uh but how are you doing tonight i'm good i'm good uh, thanks for having me uh, no thank you so mark if you could just tell the folks out there who you are where did you come from you know you know why did uh this crazy new council president decide to just throw this chairmanship over to you of such an important committee I really want you just to jump into that and tell us about yourself. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I, I won't go too deep into it. Um, I'm, I'm originally from 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 New York City. I, I moved to, um, to Baltimore after leaving the EPA uh, and worked in the in the mayor's office for about five years in city stat. Um, I, I started out as an analyst and um, I, I worked my way up to um, deputy director. Uh, and for time served as acting director at city stat, um, you know, I, I, I really got to dig into a lot of the, the work of the city to really understand how the city ticks to understand how the agencies run. Um, you know, I even had the fortunate opportunity to serve as the, the police analyst for 3 and a half years and really got a good sense of the good, the bad, the ugly, the opportunities and, um, some of the weaknesses of what we were doing. And, um, you know, when I, when I decided to run for, for the seat in the 4th. Um, I was really hoping to put those things into play. Um, you know, I, I, I left my time, uh, I left after some time in the city um, and I started running a nonprofit, um, uh, planting trees in Baltimore and training folks for jobs and tree, and tree care and landscaping, um, often working with uh, uh, returning citizens um, and, and then got my call and run for, for, for city council. And, um, you know, when, when you chose me to be the chair of the public safety and government operations committee, I was completely floored. I had no idea it was coming. Um, but when I, when I really think about, uh, the experience that I had working in the mayor's office, um, overseeing and working with, um, the city agencies, it, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate you even taking the time to even look into me as an incoming councilman and, and give me that opportunity. And I take it seriously. Um, and, you know, we've been doing a lot of work since I came on. I think 
we met every week, but one week. <laughs> We've had nonstop work, um, and we, we've actually got a lot of work done. Um, so it's it's been amazing being on this side now, but um, one, seeing it from the executive side and now seeing it from the legislative side, uh, I come with a pretty unique perspective, um, and hopefully hopefully that, that leads to good policy. No, and um, Mark, I can remember, um, I was so excited to actually call you to tell you that you were going to be chair of uh, public safety and government operations. And I remember, you know, I think you might have been my first call because I was so excited about this aha moment that I had in my mind and said, Mark Connolly is the right person for what you're trying to do with public safety and government operations. And I remember calling you and you're like, no way. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, no way. Like, you know, you're going to be chair. And this is what I want from you, and this is how it's going to to go. And and you were so excited, and I was so thankful, and I I still am. Um, you know, I think you're you're extremely humble, but you know, I think you know when we take a step back and we talk about public safety, you know, public safety has always been used, particularly in Baltimore, by everybody, as like you know that thing that is always the shiny object that we can always point to, that we can always talk about. Unfortunately, when we go out the outside of the city. It drives the perception of like who we are. When we take Baltimore and the Hollywood, that's exactly what they kind of paint. It's always this issue around public safety. But we really want to kind of paint public safety in a different way, meaning we know that it's we have problems and we know we need to dig out of these problems. But there's a way of doing it. Um, there's a way of, of trying to uh, stand on a soapbox and talk about it, or there's a way of really digging into the data. And that's why I chose you because I know that. Uh, there is no one more suited on the council that's able to dig into the data the way you are because you were there from a city stat perspective. If you could kind of talk to us about, uh, I guess, some of the things that we've been working on with the police department, um, thoughts that you have in your mind, um, and then the expanded vision as it relates to utilizing your experience from city stat uh, to kind of where we are today to cut out the politics about you know, how we operate these meetings. Uh, and really drive to a solution that's beneficial to not only the city council, to the police department, but more importantly, to the citizens of Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, no, I, all those things are all right. And, um, you know, the way that I've sort of looked at um, our approach to public safety and particularly the police department um, has really been uh, on looking at, you know, the, the, the basics that we need to do to be an effective um, police department. Um, so the very first meeting that you know we we held with the police department was talking about the consent decree, um, not only because you know um, we we know we need to make some significant changes in our police department, but because now we are mandated to do that. Um, it is the very basis for which everything the police department will do for maybe the next couple of years. And if we don't understand that, um, if we can't get that right, uh, we're not going to be able to get a lot, a lot of other things right. So I think starting from that, understanding what the consent decree means to the city, to the police department, how it allows them to operate, um, what it means for the work they do and the, and the way they interact with, with residents of the city, I think is the very groundwork um, for everything else that will be happening out of the, the police department. Um, and been really fortunate to, to work with Commissioner Harrison on that. And he's been, um, he's been a, a, a great resource ally thus far. And I'm excited to continue to do that. Um, after that, you know, the, the next biggest piece is helping him actually execute his vision. Um, I'm one of the nerds who read through every page of his his plan. Um, and, you know, I think he's got a great plan. Um, you know, the, the real difficulty, though, is not in pulling together the plan, but it's in executing it. Um, it's it's increasing, you know, the, the number of officers that we have on the street so that we don't have significant overtime. It's um, making sure that those officers are, pro officers are properly trained, um, making sure that we have strong systems and, um, and and we can hold our police department accountable in that in that regard. Um, but it's really starting from the ground up, building the very basics. And I think the basics, um, unfortunately, but fortunately, start with the, the consent decree, what we have to do. We don't have a choice. We have to do this. Um, but then uh, the plan thereafter and making sure that we're executing on, along those lines. And if if that's a good plan, and if we execute it right, then we'll begin to see changes in the numbers. Um, you know, so understanding the numbers, understanding where we are, understanding why we think we are where we are um, is, I think, important. Um, but but we need to make sure that we're actually executing on the work. And I didn't, I didn't want to take the. Um, 
what I want to make sure we, we don't do is just talk about the numbers in the, in, in the committee. Uh, we want to make sure that we are executing the plan um, because we can, we can Google the numbers. We can go on, um, you know, open Baltimore and find the numbers. It's all available. Um, and, and certainly we can hold a hearing talking about them, but if we're not actually helping the police department execute the plan um, that hopefully will reduce crime and specifically violent crime, um, then, then we're not, we're not doing our job right. The next piece is, um, you know, of course, a big part of it is our police department. But I mean, with all the discussion that we've had, um, you, know, from, you know, with the mayor, from the mayor, and, and the way that he looks at the crime problem, I, I agree. You know, there are other uh, facets to the problem that we have historically not appropriately ad addressed. Um, and looking at his his crime plan that he just put out um, last week, um, you know, I encourage folks that are on this line to review the plan to provide feedback on the plan. If you think it's missing something or you think it's um, um, going too far in some areas and maybe you should roll back, please let us know um, because that's what we're gonna be holding uh, other other departments that, are be, uh, that will have a significant role in this crime plan to executing on. So- and I, I, um, think the, I think the big thing there, Mr. Chair, is um, I, I'm pretty sure you've, you've had this come up, but like what is the city council's crime plan? And what I've constantly told folks is it's not our responsibility to make a crime plan. It's our responsibility uh, to be partners in progress with the police commissioner, with the mayor in supporting their crime plan. Like the city of Baltimore does not need two competing crime plans. We need one crime plan, right? And that's a responsibility of the mayor and the police commissioner of working out. It's our responsibility of developing legislation to go after the roots of why crimes take place to get to our children before they get to the criminal justice system, to provide real opportunities for our communities. And I think that, um, you know, I think that that has been a welcoming call, knowing that we have a legislative branch that is really going to be focused on those areas while supporting the administration and supporting the police commissioner as it relates to their actual crime plan. And, you know, again, that's why I'm excited. I know that you share that same, you know, thought pattern as it relates to how we tackle crime. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. Uh, one of the other things that you brought up was the consent decree. And I think we're still working on it. It's not perfect yet, um, but the citizens will see um, the development of where we are in the process of the consent decree in ways that they have not seen before. And I think, you know, as it relates to our collective partnership and working together with the police department, that's one of the things that we've hammered and continue to drill down with BPD of like, how can we develop a very digestible way of communicating to folks all the work that's happening behind the scenes on the consent decree to show the progress, but more importantly, show what's left. Uh, if you kind of want to talk about that, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, in, in absolutely. There. And um, you, myself, and, and Commissioner Harrison have been working incredibly hard to make sure that um, that, that process is transparent. Um, I, you know, everyone on this call and anyone that then views this thereafter is familiar with the consent decree, but many people don't know what it means. Um, they don't know exactly what the police department has to do in order to complete the consent decree, um, let alone how far along we are in that process. And I think one of the key things that we're working with the police department on is to help make that a little more transparent, um, to, to help make sure that as we have our check-ins, we, we have a sense of where the progress is and where we're lagging behind and to understand why we're lagging behind in those areas. Um, you know, I think that's the only way that you can really get things done. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, a, a big part of our work will be um, making it very clear for folks, um, you know, using that data, um, data, 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 to make it very clear to folks where we are um, and, and working with BP, BPD to be a little more transparent in that regard. Um, Nope, perfect. Now, the last question I'm going to ask you, Chairman Conway, is uh, mm -hmm. you are much more uh, diverse uh, and eclectic that goes far beyond public safety. Uh, um, I'm not going to say environment, but, you know, wherever you <laughs> want to take it, um, you know, what are some other policy issues or things that you are really focusing on um, that kind of hit home? You know, I remember, I think maybe a week or two in, you talked about um, some homeless issues that you had just saw, like literally right outside your front door window. I mean, your front window, um, 
you know, but what are some of the other things that you really focus on that um, you look for over the next couple of years to try to have a, a, a legislative impact on? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the very first things we, we put through um, was, was focusing on, on, on water billing. Um, and of course, we have that hearing coming up actually this Thursday. Um, so I encourage folks who are on the line to, to, um, to testify if you've had issues with water billing. I think it's going to be important to making sure that we operate well as a city and can be held accountable um, with, you know, making sure that folks get proper bills. Um, you know, government operations, just generally making sure that we are doing our job and doing it well, I think is really important. Um, but understanding where those, those deficiencies are is, is important as well. Um, of course, you alluded to earlier environment. Um, Excuse you started me. smiling when you said environment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, so, so smiling. I mean, I mean, listen, so I, I always got the, the green thumbs award in Annapolis for environment. You know, there's not many times where you get to see two brothers who care about the environment the way that we care about the environment, particularly as it relates to environmental justice for our communities. Uh, so I know you've done a tremendous amount of work in our city as it relates to, you know, expanding the uh, tree, tr tree canopy uh, footprint in our city. Uh, but literally jump into that when we talk about environment, because that is just as important, important as social justice and all the other things that we talk about, particularly when we talk about life expectancy and health disparities in our community. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you can talk, you can talk all the way down the line. You talk about life expectancy, you talk about air quality, you talk about urban heat island effect, you talk about home values. When you look at where the trees are, it, it's all aligned. Um, and I think, you know, um, I don't, I don't like to go into a rabbit hole because I think it's very easy for folks to sort of peg me as, as one thing, but, um, you know, that looking, looking into the opportunities around protecting trees around the city and making sure that we can increase our tree canopy is going to be one of the things we focus on going forward. Um, you know, we, we also put forward um, uh, with uh, Councilwoman Porter a bill looking into um, the impact of COVID uh, on, on our economy, and we want to make sure that um, we're taking advantage of the opportunities that are coming down from the federal level, um, but 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 also that um, we're, we're staying in line with what the plan is for the city along the lines of um, our economic plan. So, um, you know, I'm looking at tackling a bunch of issues. Um, you know, we're, we're looking into equity issues as well. Um, but you know, excited that to you know this this first hundred days has been a whirlwind. I've been learning a lot along the way, um, and you know. Um, looking forward to, to the next hundred and more. Uh, we, we got a lot of work to do. So we have a, we have a whole lot of work to do, Mr. Chair. I, I guess it, are, are there any final thoughts that you want to kind of impose? And after we go from your final thoughts, we're going to jump into questions and answers uh, from folks out there. Um, but anything that you kind of want to bring up or or kind of talk sure. about? Sure, 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 sure. So we so got a couple this, pieces. At that this are... point, this is the Chairman Conway Show. So it's it's completely turned over to you. You can talk about it, say whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, you know, I want to, you know, invite folks to to watch the committee and a lot of the work that we have coming up, and of course, testify if these issues are relevant to you. Uh, we have a couple of pieces that are coming up um, just around the corner. Um, so we, we have a hearing in the um, in the oversight committee that'll be happening on Thursday, of course, with water billing, which I've alluded to. Um, we also have a couple of hearings um, coming up in the uh, Public Safety and Gover Government Operations Committee. Um, one talking about uh, our quarterly crime statistics. So we'll be working regularly with BPD to talk through those statistics, um, talk through their progress, and, um, and and have a chance to to work with them. Um, we'll also be holding a hearing uh, on April seventh with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood and Safety Engagement. Um, to begin talking through the draft of their um, the, the safety plan out of the mayor's office, uh, want to understand what it is and um, to you know solicit feedback from folks in the community. Um, so you know, I, I, with that, all, all I want to say is if folks are um, interested, please come out. We look forward to having you and um, you know eager to serve. I'm fortunate to have the opportunity. I want to thank you, President Mosby, for the opportunity to, to serve as chair. Um, it's been great. No, I thank you for uh, your leadership. You have literally hit the ground running. I know you hear that from me constantly, but I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm excited about your leadership and what you mean to the city of Baltimore, and we're going to continue, continue to push forward. Uh, we're going to turn it over to some Q&As uh, from the audience. 
Uh, I'm not sure who's reading off the questions, but we're here to deliver answers. Got you covered, Mr. President. A couple of housekeeping issues real quick. A reminder that everybody, please go to BaltimoreCityCouncil.com. BaltimoreCityCouncil.com. You can sign up for our newsletter, for our magazine. You can sign up for all of our uh, information that comes out and updates. So please do that. We did have a question about the crime plans for the mayor. So I want to let everybody know that they can go to BaltimoreCity.gov. Uh, specifically, there's a button there to click on for the mayor's office. If you go to his uh, neighborhoods uh, division department, they have all of that information there. So again, there's information out there at the mayor's office. It's BaltimoreCity.gov, so they can do that. Having said that, here is our first question. And Mr. President, you talked earlier about the expanded role that the council will have. This question came in. Will the council consider implementing participatory budgeting for the people of Baltimore? This would include oh, wow. policy, enhance trust between Baltimore residents and the government and ensure an equitable distribution of public funds throughout Baltimore. That's our first question. So there you Man, go. Man, that, that, that's a that's a smoker. That's a, 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 a interesting question. So I'm not do you know who answered it? Who asked that question? Do you have a name or anything? I do not have a name for that one. It came all right, it's it's all good. Um so whoever asked that question, um actually one of my last things uh, on the council um when I when I was a council member was looking at participatory budgeting. Uh, and at the time, uh, the, the city of New York had recently passed some legislation that we were that I was really looking into and really interested in. Um, the issue that I've had with participatory um, budgeting is, you know, the squeaky uh, wheel gets the all the oil, right? So it's normally the communities and the interests uh, that have the most um, connectivity uh, resources network into city government that kind of prioritizes their issues over um, uh, other communities. Uh, and it kind of exacerbates the issue around equity. Uh, so I'm definitely interested in looking at a model of participatory budgeting, particularly knowing in the budget of 2022, the council will have budget authority. Um, but I think it's really important that when we look at it, we look at it in a way through a lens of equity. Um, because what I do not want is folks who already have significant amount of influence uh, because of the social economics uh, with their community that they are also the ones that are first in line with that five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent budgetary uh, participation. So definitely interested in it. Uh, something I, I think the, the council will definitely take up in the future. Uh, but we have to ensure that we look at it through uh, a lens of equity. So thank you for that question. I think it's very timely and I'm excited to uh, explore how we can do that in an equitable manner. Got a name for that question that came in from Juliet. Oh, well, Juliet, your, your perfect question. Uh, please email me about it. We'll continue to push forward and we're going to continue to um, to study the, study the topic of it. Okay, next question here. We actually have two questions. So we have um, Kareem sent in two questions. Start with the first one. I know that we already have a program for giving out tax breaks. I'm, I'm framing the question. He's asking about tax breaks for city employees who live in the city. So I know we already have an existing program for, I believe, firefighters and police officers. So I will reframe the question and ask, is there a plan to expand the current tax break program for city workers in the city to reach more city workers? So actually there's been a lot of work in Annapolis of doing that. I supported a bill uh, when I was on, when I was a state delegate last session to actually do that, to kind of expand the tax credits, uh, particularly as it relates to purchasing of homes uh, uh, for city residents. Uh, I'm sorry, for city employees, um, but I'm all for it. I think that the more we create this ecosystem of city workers, uh, living in the city, paying tax dollars in the city, supporting their city, the better outcome we get in our communities. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Chairman Conway, if you have anything to kind of add to that, um, being over um, uh, operations committee. Yeah, yeah. no, I think uh, one of the biggest issues that we have is um, we have a lot of folks who work for the city, but unfortunately don't live in the city. 
Um, and I think that's a, a real opportunity perhaps to encourage folks to, to take that leap and to invest in the city as well. Um, so as we think about ways to incentivize that, I think certainly a tax break um, for city employees would be something that would be palatable. And, and always our biggest challenge is our biggest opportunity. And we know that Baltimore City is full of space and opportunity as it relates to vacant properties and, uh, and communities that we need to have an injection of, 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 of presence and of energy. And I think that there are opportunities to kind of do that uh, and align with not only attracting folks to Baltimore, uh, but ensuring, like uh, Chairman said, keeping our city employees here in the city of Baltimore. Again, I'm going to continue to pat myself on the back. I'm not, don't hold me to this stat, but I think like 95% of like my front office all live in the city of Baltimore. Um, and, you know, I think that when you have folks that are working for the city that actually live in the city, um, I think that that is like the perfect match of what we need to like really push our city in the next direction. Next question. All right, this is Kareem again with a follow up, and he's asking for some statistics that I know we don't have on hand. But I'm you were ask... supposed to pull them up when we were talking, Derek. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah, you, know, that, that. you got the city stat guy and Chairman Conway on here. He's disappointed. So somebody asked yeah. for a stat and we don't have it yet. Yes, because he's asking just as a sample. How many city residents or homeowners in the city? How many city employees live in the city versus the county? He's asking questions like that, but the heart of his questions, I will phrase this way. How do we encourage more workers in the city to buy and live in the city? Because the essence of Kareem's question is uh, that we have a number of workers who work outside of the city, I mean, who live outside the city. So basically they're taking the tax dollars from their jobs outside the city back to Anne Arundel, Hartford County, uh, Howard County and the like. So how do we put things in place to encourage more people to buy and live in the city? I saw your hand raised, Chairman. I don't, I don't wanna um, say oh. something that's steal your thunder. Do you, do you wanna kinda oh. take a well, look, man, at this I, I, I tried to quickly look up some stats. Come on, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> it took me, it, it was that, this fact. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have staff for the whole city. Um, but just looking at, and, and this has been from a concerted effort from, um, from the BPD um, with identifying new classes coming in. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, through 312-2020, um, about 46% of the folks that, that were in, in one of their classes were living in Baltimore City. Um, and the, to be fair, the, the police departments work really, 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 really hard as of late to try to turn that number around. It's, it's I think that, I think that's almost like a twofold increase. I think yeah. it used to be more like twenty percent. Uh, it was twenty one percent. Yeah. Uh, in, in the previous year. Yeah. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. I, I also remember a stat, and and Kareem, don't quote me on this, but I remember a stat that it's like two hundred thousand people that come into the city every day to work. Like for you know all types of jobs, you know all, all you know the the full spectrum. But I think your 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 question sits at the heart of many of the things that we talked about. I mean, we look at the sign behind me, be more local jobs, right? So you know we want the jobs that are public sector jobs, but also private sector jobs created from the city of Baltimore to go to local residents. Um, I say that not only as it relates to um, like an adult population, but and but what are we doing to like create the pipelines in middle school as early as middle school of identifying young folks uh, and putting them on non traditional tracks to jobs that they can be successful with. Um, we've had this ability of like looking at uh, software uh, that have algorithms and like artificial artificial intelligence of like really getting into the heads of our young folks to say like what are you interested in and putting out these are jobs that your characteristics fit directly uh, uh, to becoming successful in this career pipeline and exposing them at a very early age. You know, when we talk yeah. about youth works, youth work shouldn't be just kids sweeping streets, youth works or, or, or sitting at, you know, some random corner uh, making photocopies. Youth work should be tied to the natural characteristics of our young folks as it relates to exposing them to jobs of tomorrow. I think uh, Chairman Stokes has a succession a bill that's out there, a resolution to look at if we have succession planning in our city agencies. I'm gonna tell you now, we don't. I talk to all agencies all the time. Like we're losing all this institutional knowledge. What are we doing to replace it? 
we need to look at ways of replacing it with city residents. So, Kareem, I think you are dead on. I am totally in favor of, you know, developing ways, uh, not just as it relates to existing jobs, Chairman Conway, but also ensuring that we're developing uh, pathways for our young folks uh, through YouthWorks, through internships, you know, while they're attending local colleges so they can ultimately take on those jobs and roles and responsibilities of city government and city city work. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'll, I'll tag on to just uh, quickly something you mentioned about uh, Chairman Stokes' bill uh, that was just put, put forward on Monday. Um, in our council luncheon, I, I, talk, I talked a little bit about um, the current state of the city with regard to the eligibility of city employees to retire within the next five years. And I remember my time when I was in the mayor's office, um, we, I want to say like 65% of city employees were eligible, some, some ridiculous number that you would never believe were eligible for retirement within five years. Uh, I just could not believe that the number was that high. It was way more than 50%, which is what would shock me. So when we think about, um, you know, odds are that many people will not retire in five years, but uh, what it means is that we're gonna have a significant uh, transfer of knowledge, insight, um, experience and otherwise that will leave the city soon, um, you know, because of retirement. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are uh, training folks so that we don't lose that opportunity and we begin to see um, city services then lag behind as a result, let alone um, making sure that our young people can get these jobs and be prepared for these jobs. Um, but if we're going to be a strong city, if we're going to deliver strong city services, we want to make sure that, um, that that wealth and knowledge is, we begin to transfer that well before folks are um, leaving. Yeah. We have a few more questions, but I just want to, as I see time is starting. We're, we're bumping up on that TV 25 window, right? We are. So I want to let everybody know that may have asked the question that we will be pushing out some additional information after the town hall. So if you do not get your question addressed, look for some additional information for those we may not be able to get to. Having said that, um, Antoinette has a great question that follows up on the question that Kareem just asked, which is, what is the city council doing to address skyrocketing property taxes? So one of those barriers to getting people to move back into the city and yeah, yeah. Of those gateways to getting people out of the city is on the taxes. So um, there you go, Mr. Council President. Antoinette, uh, you, you threw another curveball. What I think one of the things that we have not done in the first 100 days is done anything substantive around uh, property, you know, real estate tax. But I think it is something that is on the tip of, of my mind uh, and of my interest uh, for us to really work with the administration and dig down into this. Again, I said earlier, you know, our biggest challenge is also our biggest set of opportunities, uh, and that's real estate, uh, particularly in communities that are ripe for growth potential and, and, and redevelopment. So, you know, we have not done anything specifically to your question. I'm sorry, what was her name, uh, Derek? That came in from uh, Antoinette. Antoinette, I, I cannot say that we have done anything specific in the first 100 days. Um, but that is something that this council will take on. I have a couple crazy ideas in my mind. Really interested in hearing from you, Antoinette, if you have some ideas. I'm not sure, Chairman Conway, if, if you want to take on this question or if you have anything to add to the to the question. I, I can tell you something I'm very interested in, well, in as well. And I also have some crazy ideas. <laughs> um, I, I'm being that, careful. That, 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 that might be ideas. a bad thing. <laughs> they, oh, oh, yeah. well, my my crazy idea is on one extreme and yours on the other. Well, I think I think we all realize that this is an issue that is um, unfortunately making us less competitive in the region and amongst our own peers in the other counties. Um, so it's something we have to address, um, but we want to make sure that we're responsible in addressing it. Um, of course, that that you know, property tax is a major, major, major um, piece of of the revenue source for the city. So we want to be thoughtful about that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person. Uh, I'm sure we're not the only people on the council that are trying to think through responsible ways to reduce property taxes. Yeah, I mean, and to your point, it is it does provide a competition problem with us and our surrounding counties. But I also think, Chairman, that we do a really, really poor job of communicating 
our very competitive homestead tax credit, right? Mm -hmm. um, of folks, you know, again, I'm a constantly say our biggest challenge, also our biggest opportunity, but somebody like me who bought a house that didn't have a roof, I could stand on my basement floor and see the sky. You know, when you talk about homestead tax credit um, and, you know, the, the triennial like review and only being able to increase by 4%, you know, every three years, um, that is a huge carrot that we do not communicate enough to folks about. So definitely the, 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 the tax issue, the effective tax issue is a major problem on real estate. Um, but then also, I think we have to do a much better job of selling some of the instruments that we have uh, to really, you know, go after some of these communities that have been struggling for far too long. And then Derek, uh, I, I, we're, we're, we're pushing up on um, the, the um, TV 25's yeah. uh, uh, grace window for us. We, we, we got a couple uh, speed questions you can ask us. One more question that we will address, but I want to remind everybody again, please go to BaltimoreCityCouncil.com, sign up so we can push out some additional information to you uh, now and in the future. So we'll end on this question, and then if you, uh, Mr. Chair, and you, Mr. Council President, want to wrap us up, uh, we'll go from there. So here is the last question we're going to address tonight. This is from Mecca, and the question is, how does the Education Committee plan on handling the current Baltimore City Schools problem? So first of all, Mecca, I love your name, so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but secondly, uh, we actually on Monday um, announced the hearing for the issue. And I think that when we talk about city schools, we know that education sits at the foundation of all of our problems, right? Um, we know that the city of Baltimore needs to do much more as it relates to uh, from a resources perspective in putting money into education. As a delegate, I served on the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I was very instrumental in the way that the Kerwin bill looks at today as it looks at uh, trying to shape and grow um, um, our schools as it relates to resources. Uh, but I also now sitting as a council president know that the city must do much more. Um, but when I say that, I also say that this is an all hands on deck type of solution. Uh, so there's parental and housing homeowner home uh, responsibility. Uh, there's community and organization responsibility when we talk about a youth fund. Uh, and then when we talk about government, there's, um, you know, our responsibility of ensuring that we are putting as much money into our young folks as possible. Mark, I always like to talk about this statistic that when we look at inflation over the past 40 years, uh, we've seen, and this directly affects your committee, we've seen um, a dis. And I think conflating those two things directly talk about where we are as it relates to a public safety thing. So we have to turn the spigot off. We have to do more for our young folks. That starts with education. Um, you will have a commit a, a council that's committed uh, to to doing that. Um, uh, Chairman Conway, do you have anything to kind of talk to that? Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with everything there. I think when we look at um, and I, I talked about this ad nauseum on the campaign trail, but I'm sure a lot of people on this have never heard of me before. Um, but, um, you know, when we look at the problem of, of crime, when we look at the problems that we have around economic opportunity, I think it really starts in, in our schools. That is the seed behind it all. We need to make sure our, our students are prepared. Um, and, you know, we, we have to step up to the plate as a city. And, um, you know, historically, we hadn't quite done that. Um, because we've always been trying to prioritize the the most urgent issue, that being crime, um, you know. But but I think they go hand in hand. Uh, we need to make sure that young people come out of school prepared, um, and and feel like they are prepared to contribute, to work, to grow, um, as opposed to taking whatever option may come to them first. And often that's the streets. Um, so you know, I think they go hand in hand, uh, and we need we need to think about that when we're when we're making policy decisions, especially budget decisions. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't really have all that much more to add to you. Well, that, that was a lot you just added. Uh, thanks a million, uh, Mr. Chair, for joining us on our first inaugural town hall. Uh, I know that, you know, uh, folks will continue to get to know who you are and what you're about. Um, again, I can't say this enough. I'm excited about your leadership, excited about the role that you're in and look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, to the citizens of Baltimore, you know, thank you for this amazing opportunity 
again, we've done a lot in 100 days and we have a lot more to do and we'll continue to do it. We'll continue to do uh, the people's work. Uh, we ask that you continue to tune in. Make sure you check out that uh, magazine. Make sure you listen to the podcast. I have a very, very exciting guest on our inaugural podcast. Uh, but also, more importantly, please tune in every Wednesday at 9 o'clock for Board of Estimates. Tune in to your council hearings on Mondays. Uh, and then make sure that you're holding us accountable at these committee meetings. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, I just want to say, folks, who want to uh, keep up with what we're doing uh, in the Public Safety and Government, Government Operations Committee. Uh, feel free to follow us on, on Facebook at Councilman Mark Conway. And um, also, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, Mark Conway 4th. Um, and, you know, we, we always put updates out there when we're, when we got bills coming up or if there are issues that folks may really care about. So I encourage folks to do that as well. So, so Baltimore, you. we're signing out. Uh, we're going to continue to say, be more, expect more. So remember that slogan. That's what you're going to get from this council. Be more, expect more. Baltimore, I absolutely love you. Thank you for this opportunity. Look forward to you tuning in. Please stay engaged. Please stay committed. Please keep us and hold us accountable. Be more expectant. <laughs>